His disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And Jesus saith to them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And rising up, he commanded the winds and the sea, and there came a great calm. Words taken again from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If I were asked to pick a favorite saint outside of Our Lady and Good St. Joseph, I would probably pick St. Louis Marie de Montfort, the author of True Devotion to Mary, a spiritual slave of the Holy Virgin, a powerful preacher of parish missions and retreats. And yes, de Montfort was a true enemy of those revolutionary forces that would wish to uncrown Christ the King. But there's one event in the life of St. Louis Marie de Montfort that I would like to recount for you. This particular event is important for us, I think, particularly. After having preached eight parish missions in a row, which takes a lot of effort, he was preaching eight missions in a row in one part of France. De Montfort began to ponder, even dream about building a gigantic shrine, a place of pilgrimage, a Calvary scene complete with a life-size cross in the corpus of our Lord and obviously Our Lady and Good St. John and Mary Magdalene, that great Calvary scene along with a large way of the cross that would dominate the entire countryside. That was his dream. He obtained the land and soon sought to work. The labor was all given by willing volunteers. Inspired by de Montfort, over 20,000 volunteers came to work on the pilgrimage site, some as far away from Italy and Spain. Everything was donated as a gift to God. The work was eventually finished, and a blessing by the bishop was scheduled for September 14th. What a perfect day. The feast of the triumph of the cross. That's when it will be blessed. But it should be noted that the Montfort had many, many enemies. The Jansenist heretics despised him. The Calvinists, they tried to poison him. In fact, they probably were responsible for his very death. They hated him. And yes, the so-called enlightened liberals, the Freemasonic sort of ancestors of the day, despised him as well. And they all joined forces to defeat de Montfort's plan of building that Calvary. His enemies convinced the king of France himself that somehow the Calvary, the pilgrimage site, was actually meant to be a fortress, that it was a military threat and a risk to national security as opposed to a place of devotion. Therefore, on September 13th, one day before the blessing, de Montfort received word that the blessing had been called off. No blessing. The saint, therefore, hurried on foot through the night in order to see the bishop. He arrived exhausted on the morning of the 14th, and the bishop gave him the sad news. Although he had fought as hard as he could against the authorities, there was nothing that could be done. The king ordered the Calvary scene, so painstakingly and lovingly built by volunteers, to be taken down block by block by block. And the ones who took it down were the very peasants who built the Calvary scene. And it was all done under the watchful eyes of the government with armed soldiers making sure that the work was done of destruction. Montfort's personal humiliation must have been nothing compared to the anguish he felt for those who invested so much of their energy and time in building that work for the glory of God. The Montfort then turned to the people and sought to console them. He said, we were not able to build this Calvary shrine standing physically before our eyes. Therefore, let us build a Calvary within our hearts. At the bishop's advice, de Montfort went on retreat. In that time of silent suffering, the Jesuits who ran the retreat house were amazed at de Montfort's attitude. As one Jesuit priest who observed him wrote later, quote, I thought I would find, find him downcast and disappointed. 
I prepared myself to do as much as I could to console him. But I was astonished to find him happier and more peaceful than I was myself. The observer continued, I said to him jokingly, My, you are acting like a strong and courageous fellow. The Montfort replied, I am neither strong nor courageous. But thanks be to God, I am neither grievously pained nor desolate. I'm at peace. The Jesuit priest asked him, You are content then that they have destroyed your Calvary? I am neither content nor discontent, De Montfort responded. The Lord allowed me to build it, but now he has allowed it to be destroyed. Blessed be his holy name. If it had depended upon me, De Montfort continued, the Calvary would have stood until the end of time. But since it depends upon God, may his will be done and not mine. I would prefer, O oh my God, to die a thousand times than to oppose your holy will, unquote. This is like Job. The Lord gives good things. He gives bad things. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Remember the time when St. Margaret, Marguerite de Uville, famous Canadian saint, when her convent that she had spent so much effort to construct along with so many others burned to the ground, she demanded that all the sisters gather around the burned out place and sing the Te Deum, a song of thanksgiving. The Lord gives, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When the Jesuits were suppressed by Pope Clement XIV, suppressed, they were given the message that they could no longer practice as Jesuits. And they were asked by the particular visitators of the Holy See to accept this ruling of suppression. And all the Jesuits knelt before the will of God. And they said, yes, gladly. On July 7, 2007, Pope Benedict XVI, God rest his soul, normalized, normalized the ancient rites of the Mass and the sacraments for Latin Rite Catholics and priests. The old Mass was back. Gone were the days of prohibition. Gone were the days of ghetto-wise pockets. Gone were the days of indults and special permissions and bureaucratic obstacles. The old mass, the sacraments, and their more ancient form were back because we were told clearly after investigations they had never been abrogated. In fact, they couldn't be abrogated. As Pope Benedict wrote, quote, this is a letter he wrote to accompany his motu proprio, what earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too. And it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. He then ended by saying it behooves all of us to preserve the riches which have developed in the church's faith and prayer and to give them their proper place, unquote. Can't be considered harmful. How could it be forbidden? Traditional Catholics were given greater latitude, greater liberty to worship in the ways the Church of Rome has always worshipped. Tradition began to grow, began to build, build up parishes, apostolates, works, chaplaincies. It's amazing how many nuns, cloistered nuns especially, want the old rites. Schools open, retreat houses opened. Faithful and serious Catholic families and individuals seem to be drawn more and more towards the mass of our ancestors. But in the midst of all this growth, all this enthusiasm, resistance, right? Good things are resisted. That's why martyrs happen. They're resisted. Resistance toward tradition began to grow more and more. Some went so far as to suggest that the traditional Catholic with his traditional liturgies somehow was holding back the full expression of the recent council and the full flourishing of the church. What was the problem with the church? It's, it's the people in that corner over there. 
a new Roman pontiff was on the throne of Peter, and he clearly stated that the old rites were to be phased out. Latin masses were to be eliminated, little by little. Other old rite sacraments, confirmation, baptism, marriages, were to be forbidden in most every place. Truly, Catholics were to be denied, by and large, any parochial parish life. That's the plan. All that had been built up had to be torn down. For we no longer pray like we used to pray. That's what we were told. We don't pray that way anymore. But despite this sad report, there's still hope. And we cling to it. For the good Lord is in charge of everything. Blessed be his holy name. We should not forget that traditional Catholicism is not always appreciated by everybody. As your pastor, I am charged with guiding you, hopefully like a shepherd who guides a flock, charged with protecting you from wolves in some way, and providing verdant pastures in order to nourish you with the sacraments and with sound doctrine. But with that being stated, I as a shepherd have noted that there are threats on the horizon. A storm is brewing like the storm on the Sea of Galilee today in the gospel. We should prepare for difficult times ahead, for there is much resistance to tradition. The first preparation is more preemptive in nature. In other words, we should take precautions now, since we anticipate there might be challenges in the future. I would ask you to join me in reciting a novena in honor of Our Lady of Lords, beginning again on February 2nd and ending on February 10th. But along with this particular desire for to pray the novena, I would ask you to make a sacrifice as part of your prayer. Sacrifices make prayer more powerful, more heard by God. Maybe the sacrifice of a fast, abstinence from flesh meat, fasting from social media, or some other mortification. And there are three special intentions I would ask you to include in this novena. Number one, for the protection and future flourishing of our own traditional Latin Mass personal parish. Number two, for the protection and future flourishing of the community that runs this parish. And number three, for the protection and future flourishing of the traditional Latin Mass and all the ancient sacramental rituals of Rome throughout the entire Latin Rite. Remember, this is not too long ago. The Fraternity of St. Peter, great, wonderful society of priests, nearly one year ago on February 11th, 2022, received a special decree protecting that institution in part from the full weight of the motu proprio traditionis custodis. This came after all the FSSP priests seminarians, and parish lay folk like yourselves stormed heaven with novena in honor of Our Lady of Lords. That's what they chose. Perhaps the good Lord will have mercy on us and protect our parish and our religious community. But we must also prepare in other ways. What if there were to be a negative scenario where our parish might be limited in some way from its full traditional apostolate Confirmation is up in the air. What right will it be in? We have the right for the confirmation of the old right. It's part of our decree that has opened up this parish. But that might be limited. The refusal to provide minor or major orders for our seminarians. We'll see what happens. Or perhaps being told to embrace the liturgical revolution brought on in the post-conciliar years by introducing perhaps the new mass here from time to time, or even a threat to the continuance of the religious community unless certain compromises are made, like concelebration of the new rite. What if all that has been built is somehow harmed or brought down? If our traditional apostolate and the works of so many others become an object of resistance, then we must, with St. Louis Marie de Montfort, keep tradition alive in our hearts and perhaps in more private and hidden ways. 
In our attempts to withstand the possible resistance to come, we cannot resist the cross that might be meant for us. Good things are resisted, but the cross should never be resisted. De Montfort wrote a short, short literary work known as A Letter to the Friends of the Cross. A Letter to the Friends of the Cross. And there is a quotation in that great book which reads the following, quote, Suffer all sorts of crosses without exception and without choice. My dear friends of the cross, De Montfort writes, make the resolution to suffer any kind of cross without excluding or choosing any. Any poverty, any injustice, any loss, illness, humiliation, contradiction, slander, spiritual dryness, desolation, etc., but just say to the Lord when it happens, my heart is ready, O God, my heart is ready. Be prepared then, de Montfort says, to be forsaken by men, forsaken by angels, and seemingly forsaken by God himself, as if he forgets us. To be persecuted, envied, betrayed, slandered, discredited, abandoned by everybody. To suffer hunger, thirst, poverty, nakedness, exile, imprisonment, the gallows, and all kinds of torture, even though you have done nothing to deserve it, unquote. I provided a copy of this book. It's in the back of the church. Friends of the Cross, it's for free. For all the registered parishioners, families, the individuals. I would like you to think that this is almost necessary spiritual reading during this time. While we will not compromise in any way with the liturgical or doctrinal revolution that is so present today, we will also not resist the cross that may be offered to us. Taking up a cross potentially meant for us, for our parish, for our religious community, or for tradition in general will mean future graces and blessings. If you take the cross up, you're blessed. In closing, that wondrous Calvary scene that was destroyed by the enemies of de Montfort was eventually rebuilt and made better than ever. Today, the devotional site is much more ambitious than even St. Louis de Montfort had imagined it could ever be. Not only a life-size Calvary and way of the cross are now present, but also statuary and images representing all the mysteries of the Holy Rosary. Numerous devotional chapels with pious images and relics surround this pilgrimage site, and it's built like a fortress, like a rock. If we embrace the cross, if we don't resist it, then tradition will arise and gain victory. While modernism and the liturgical revolution it brought on will be but a forgotten memory, relegated to the dustbin of history. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.